It was one of those late nights on the job, but that didn't bother me at all. In fact, it was one of my favorite parts of being a park ranger. Hanging around late at night with just a few of my fellow rangers in the middle of the woods, it was just like huddling around a campfire while you told stories, except we were indoors around a fireplace. It was the middle of spring, but it had been cold lately, so while the afternoons were pleasant, the nights had been chilly, which was why we were all inside gathered around a fire while on the clock. The ranger station was beyond comfortable with a fire, so I was contently sitting in one of the many leather couches facing it. We were all midway through a shift, and like many nights on the job, it was quiet, so we got to talking about nothing in particular. There's nothing like the natural flow of an unplanned conversation. Outside, the evening had slowly given way to night, and the darkness had settled upon the woods with its usual silent thoroughness. The area may be a park during the day, but at night it was the woods. Parks inherently sound fun and brings to mind cookouts. Whereas the woods has an inherently spooky vibe. There were four of us sitting by the fire in the ranger station on that chilly night. Me, Harlan, Anthony, and Craig. Craig had just finished talking about his cousin's wedding when Anthony asked Harlan what his scariest story was from working here all these years. Usually, Harlan just chuckled and said he'd heard some crazy things over the years, but not this time. This time, he sat there quietly for a moment before he said, The Witch of Blackthorn Creek. That was when we all went completely still. If we were just like people huddled around a campfire, Harlan was the one in charge of building the fire. He was the ranger. We always deferred to. He'd been on the job long enough to have earned that right. Harlan's family had also been in the area for generations, so if anyone had any stories to tell about what may have happened here, it was him. Plus, he was a terrific guy, hardworking and beyond helpful when you needed something. So when someone like Harlan tells you he's heard of a story like that, you listen intently, especially with the tone of voice he used, serious and no-nonsense, without a trace of amusement. The Witch of Blackthorn Creek, Harlan began in a clear voice as we all gave him our full attention. The story was first told to me by my Uncle George, who had been a lumberjack for years. According to him, people said there was a curse on the land which was placed there by a witch. It all started one year, when the harvest went bad, since there had been nothing but plentiful harvests every year it made people beyond suspicious. There was barely enough grain and stuff to get through winter. It didn't help matters that the town had generally been prosperous, but had recently started to go through some financial difficulties. Then numerous bits of misfortune happened within the community over the years. Houses burning down, people going missing and never being found again. Periodically, there would be something odd left lying around near where someone had vanished. Creepy things like weird-looking dolls made from wood that never failed to rattle people. There wasn't anyone around who people thought was capable of anything like this. And since one of the families in town had experienced something like this before in a different town, many years ago, they suspected there was some kind of curse put on them. Especially after a few people who kept track of all the strange events realized all of them took place on a full moon. Harlan took a sip of his coffee before he continued. It all came to a head when there was a terrible accident at the town lumber mill, a fire that no one could figure out how it started. Several employees died, and many others were badly injured, and the lumber mill, which was one of the biggest employers around, closed. That was when the paranoia that had been lingering under the surface boiled over. So when some people from town found an abandoned cottage in the woods near Blackthorn Creek with weird symbols written on the walls and the floor, they grabbed their torches, set the place on fire, and watched it burn. According to the crowd, the cabin took forever to burn. Much longer than the people thought possible. But once it did finally burn down, they took the ashes and buried them deep in the woods and didn't mark the location hoping that would be the end of it. And for a while, that seemed to be the case. 
But every once in a while, something would happen that would make people in town look over their shoulders. Nothing major. A bit of bad luck in the form of an injury. Or some suspicious noises outside the house after dark, and perhaps some scratch marks on the door or the wall. But ever since then, people would be very careful what they did, especially if there was a full moon. Then he paused for a moment to look at the fire, which was crackling pleasantly in the fireplace. I couldn't tell you how old I was when I first heard the story, but I remember exactly how I felt, confused, because the story, although creepy and entertaining, didn't quite make sense to me, and I said something to Uncle George about that, and he laughed. Then he said he agreed that the story was long on atmosphere and short on believability. That's when he got serious. Told me that although the story was a bit of fiction, he never doubted that it came from somewhere, and there was indeed something going on out in the woods. Then he added that it didn't matter how old I was, where I was, who I was with, or what was going on. If I got a terrible feeling, I should listen to it and I've listened to every feeling I've gotten since then. It's never served me wrong. He looked around at us, slowly taking us all in. I've never quite believed that story, but I will be the last person to deny that in all the years I've been out here, I've felt things on occasion, things that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. And on even fewer occasions I've seen things, fleeting glances at things that I wasn't sure I saw, but there was one time when I not only felt something, I heard something. The air in the ranger station was completely still. I briefly glanced at my colleagues as Harlan said this, and they met my glance, and I could see they were just as gripped by the story as I was. It was about 30 years ago, Harlan explained. I was just starting out as a park ranger. This was back in the early 90s when technology and life in general was very different from today. I'd grown up out in nature, and I'd seen plenty of scary movies, and more importantly, I'd grown up hearing countless spooky stories about what may or may not have been lurking outside, so I wasn't exactly sheltered. But there are some things you're never truly prepared to experience. The fire in the fireplace popped in the grate, but we were so absorbed in Harlan's story we barely noticed. There was plenty of wood in the fire, so we didn't have to worry about that for a while. It was early November. Halloween had just ended, which made everyone sad because I remember that year was a particularly fun one. Darkness seemed to be arriving earlier and earlier, so I was barely halfway through my shift when the sun was going down. I remember it had been raining almost every day, so the days were all gray and cloudy and the nights were damp with plenty of fog but that particular morning was dry. All the leaves that had clung to the trees had been scattered by the winds and rain, so they lay there on the grass, all damp and torn. My job on that particular day was to go around raking them up so they didn't completely cover the trails and paths that people walked on. The chill in the air was that chill only late fall can bring. The dampness that seems to soak into your skin and never let go I had just finished one section of the park and was walking back to my truck when the rain started up again, and it did so with a fury. So I hustled it to the truck, got inside, and headed back to the ranger station where I planned to spend the rest of the evening. And since it was a quiet night at the ranger station, it looked like I would get what I wanted. I was used to working the late shift by myself as the night supervisor, so being alone didn't bother me. I'd always been a quiet type who liked to read a book, so it was an ideal situation for me, except for that night. Harlan took a deep breath before he continued. Because Halloween was over and the rain had been steady, the park hadn't received as many visitors as it usually had. But I was inside the ranger station, this ranger station, in fact, which was just as cozy and warm as you see it now. Plus, now that I was done with my task, I was free to read a book, so I wasted no time in curling up by the fire with a paperback. I'd spent many a shift this way, and it was fine by me. I'd happily read a book on a nice day, but on a rainy day, nothing better. Eventually, I started to get hungry, 
Since I'd just brought a light snack, but turned out to be craving something bigger, I decided to order pizza. There was a local joint that was only a few minutes away that often delivered out here back then, so I didn't hesitate to give them a call. I ordered a medium pizza with pepperoni, and as I hung up, the rain started to really pound heavily on the station roof. I knew from experience that the rain pounding on the station roof could truly be loud. It seemed to surround you from all sides. But by the time the headlights pulled into the driveway, the rain in had faded to a slight drizzle. But I could see the grass leading up here was pretty well soaked, and there were numerous small puddles on both the grass and the road. The trees were swaying along with the winds, and the sky was getting darker by the minute as night was settling in. By now, the outdoor lights had started to switch on as the car from the pizza place pulled up in front of the station, its windshield wipers going back and forth as it stopped in front of the entrance. I stood in front of it, under the part of the roof that kept me out of the rain. The driver, a young guy named Derek in his early twenties, got out of the driver's seat and grabbed the pizzas from the passenger side. Derek had delivered here before, and he'd always done a great job. We chit-chatted as I handed him the cash with a generous tip. Then Derek handed me the pizza and was just about to go back to his car before he stopped and stared at something behind me. He paused and said that it would probably sound crazy, but it looked like there was a woman lurking in the woods near the ranger station. We all sat there silently for a moment before Harlan continued. I remember just standing there when he told me, the words sounded almost foreign as Derek said them out loud. My first reaction was that it was impossible, but there was only one way to find out, so I turned behind me to look at where he was pointing. He took another sip of coffee. The cluster of trees he was pointing at was a dense area of tall pine trees. They'd been long gone by now, but back then there wasn't much in the way of illumination out there, but even I could see there was nothing there. I stood there the pizza still clutched in my hand. As I waited for anything to happen, but nothing emerged from the woods. I was just about to turn back to Derek when I heard, get out from beside me in a hushed voice, clear as could be. I turned around immediately to look at Derek, and without saying a word, I knew he'd heard it too. But while it was creepy as could be, I didn't know for sure what it meant. It didn't come out as an ominous command. More like a warning, but I won't lie, standing there outside. I'd never felt fear like that before. I'd been afraid before, and I'd been afraid after, but not like that. That fear was less like a feeling and more like a part of your body, like it's always there and only rarely are you truly aware of it. Sitting there watching Harlan, it was clear that although we were sitting there in the present, he had been immediately transported back to that cold November night. I couldn't have told you how much time passed. May have only been a minute or two. But despite the dwindling light, I thought I could see shapes moving far out in the woods. Very far out. After a moment, you couldn't see anything at all. Then Harlan's voice became quieter. To this day, I have no idea why that sight filled me with so much fear. Just like I also have no idea how I knew it was people. But I did and I knew it was people, as in more than one, much more than one, but I had no idea exactly how many. Then almost as if on cue, I heard the word, now, and it was all the motivation I needed to tell Derek we had to go. He didn't need to be told twice, because we hopped in his car and got out of there as fast as we could. Didn't stop for about 20 miles, and we were far away from the ranger station. By that point, the fear had slowly faded, and I was starving, so we split the pizza while debating what to tell my superiors. I eventually decided to say that I was feeling really sick and went to see a doctor I knew. Harlan chuckled. But it didn't take long for me to realize my excuse for leaving would be completely forgotten, because after I left, the ranger station had been broken into by a group of people. The security camera we had at the time saw all six of them dressed from head to toe in black, break right through the front door, just crashed right through it. Then minutes later, they came back out without taking anything and vanished into the trees. The cops thoroughly searched the area but found nothing. 
I found out when I called my superiors to tell them I had to leave because I was feeling horrible. From the time on the camera, they appeared to arrive within mere minutes after I left with Derek. We all exchanged a look as the fact that he really was talking about this ranger station dawned on us. Sitting across from us, Harlan didn't say anything, but I knew he could tell the three of us were seeing the ranger station like never before. The conclusion the cops reached, Harland eventually said, is that it was a gang of professional criminals who saw the ranger station and decided to see what they could find. Since there was apparently nothing they could make use of, they split. And every year on that day since that happened, I've taken a single flower and left it by where Derek says he saw someone that night. I've never seen or heard that voice since that night. But on occasion... I felt the presence of something or someone watching me, and not in an unpleasant way, but that's the thing about the woods. There's no telling what you may find in them. And if you're really paying attention, it's amazing what you can learn. Like I learned that November night, all those years ago, was a full moon. The clouds just happened to obscure it out here. Growing up in the woods and going camping, my family and I have our fair share of bizarre and scary stories. This one I just can't seem to wrap my head around, even to this day. My parents own 35 acres of property in the deep Rockies, about two, three hours away from our home. We spent as much time as we could camping there, as we all loved it. It was secluded and beautiful, and we had a lot of freedom there as kids. My parents were both experienced campers and backpackers and had both grown up in the mountains. One day we head up at night, arriving at the property at around 9 or 10 p.m. We were all tired and start to unpack the tents and such from the car. The minute we get out, though, we all get a strange feeling. It didn't feel normal or good. We had encountered wild predators at this point and knew the feeling of being watched. But this was like being watched from all sides. We also all notice that there are no sounds. It is dead silent. Normally we would be hearing all of the insects and occasional owls, night hawks or bats, and just the general hum of a forest. Uh, nothing. We all kind of laughed nervously and maybe mentioned a few things, but got to work setting up our tents nearby. This is when the real strange stuff starts to happen. We begin to hear rustling in the branches around us, about ten feet off the ground, it seems. It almost sounded like large creatures like monkeys or raccoons jumping from tree to tree loudly, and many of them. I have never, ever seen raccoons have the ability to do something like that, and these sounds were clumsy, unlike birds. It gets louder and louder and becomes extremely unnerving. At this point, the tent is set up and my parents put my brother and I in there, telling us to stay inside. They go out with flashlights, trying to make sense of this bizarre activity. As they are outside, we start to hear these bizarre calls. I have never, ever heard anything like this before or since. Honestly, it almost sounded like humans mimicking some kind of primate holler or screech. There was an odd human-like aspect to it, and it's like they are calling and responding to each other from every direction, along with the branches cracking and rustling. My parents come back to the tent and tell us they couldn't see anything at all. I remember how shocked and frightened my mom looked, and it scared me because she was a badass that would stalk bears to get a good photo. Both my parents were not easily frightened in nature or, or at all. We are all huddled together in the tent, confused, scared, and unsure of what to do. The sounds are so loud and everywhere. It almost sounds like some crazy storm outside. Our dogs are cowered in between us all, totally freaked out. My dad decides to go out again, and I remember as he finishes unzipping the tent, the sounds stop, just like that, in an instant. And the oppressive, weird feeling is gone. He and my mom go out again to investigate and again find nothing except fallen branches and some strange marks up high on some trees. 
They come back, talk us down, and somehow manage to get us to sleep. We still talk about this to this day. None of us know what happened and have no explanation. Like I said, we had some crazy and strange things happen to us, but never anything remotely similar to what happened that night. I saw a flying mata ray also. It was magical and I rarely talk about it because I don't want anyone to say I'm crazy. It had an electric pulsing blue outline which is the only thing that made it distinguishable from the night sky. Appearing to be swimming but in the sky, it looked as if it swam through a black hole or a time warp or something. It slowly started to disappear as if walking through a door and pieces of its body would be invisible. It was in the fall of 2015 in Great Falls, Montana, where Momstrom Air Force Base is located above the Missouri River. It was seen between midnight and 3 a.m., but it was well above the height a plane would be flying and was massive. Incredible! It didn't look like it was flying. It looked as if it was underwater swimming based on the way the outline of it moved. It slowly disappeared as if it was going into a portal or something. My encounter was during firearms deer season in the late fall outside of Maresdale, Pennsylvania. My friend and I were hunting on his aunt's property. After we parked, we started up a hill that gets very steep. Where the woodbine starts, we split up. He goes off to the left, and I went all the way to the top of the hill to a deer stand that's in the woods about 40 yards from the field. This was our third day there. As I was climbing up the deer stand, I heard a distinct drawn-out whoop. I would estimate 100 yards ahead of me. I decided I didn't want to be a sitting duck in the deer stand, so I climbed down and went back into the field where I sat. Once the sun began going down, I decided to walk back down the hill. Now inside the woods was pitch black, but there was still some light in the field. Once I got to the bottom where the woodbine curves, I heard footsteps. I looked up and saw a silhouette walking on the other side of the brush where the woodbine curves. I figured it was my friend who decided to walk up to meet up with me since it was getting dark. I said, hey, did you see any deer? And all of a sudden, this thing tore into the woods and made its way up the hill. I know this was no person as it was pitch black in the woods, and there was so much debris that there was no way a person could move. At the speed this thing was, I clearly could make out the bipedal footsteps. My friend came out of the woods about 60 yards away. I saw his light before I saw him. He said he heard someone walking around and also questioned me about the whoop as he thought it was me who did it. It was then that I introduced him to the Bigfoot world and he said I never thought about all the weird stuff I heard up there until you brought it up. Apparently he has heard things up there before. Needless to say, we didn't go hunting up there again. A few years back, around the end of May, I was taking my dog out a little after midnight and I saw something fly past me. It was a beautiful, glowing blue light that was flashing, on and off like a firefly in the same fashion, getting brighter and then dimming at about the same rate, in the same organic, gradual, beautiful way. It was invisible to me when it wasn't lit up, also like a firefly in the dark. Although it wasn't completely dark, there were street lights and enough environmental light to see everything around me. And instead of being the size of an insect, this was more the size of a bird. It whooshed past me, flying in an organic, imperfect path, and in a hurried way that made me feel strongly that it was some kind of animal, creature, or being. It also seemed intelligent somehow, though I can't logically explain why. I had my eyes on it for about ten seconds straight, so I know I didn't imagine it or mistake something else. It flew right past me and up toward the window where my light was on, and I had been working by the window that night. This was an exciting, magical moment for me, but I didn't know what to think of it. 
and pretty much just went about my night and my life. A few nights later, my boyfriend came to stay over, and in the middle of the night, I got up to use the bathroom. From the bathroom window in the dark, I could see a huge, tall tree in the distance. We were on the second floor. That seemed to be full of glowing blue lights that were flashing on and off in that same firefly pattern. But these were bigger than fireflies. They were blue with a slight green hue mixed in. I called him to the window to look, and we stood watching together and then got back into bed and watched from there for quite a while until we couldn't stay awake anymore. We were both seeing it, and we were both in awe and disbelief. This tree was far away, and I very much doubt that anything as small as a firefly would have been so visible or so bright or so big in our field of vision at that distance. They seemed to be lighting up in these synchronous patterns, not all at once, but as if in a chain of communication. It would go completely dark at times, and then we would see one again, then two then. Three, then ten. There was some flying in the air, too. They weren't all in the tree. I never saw these again that spring or summer or since. We are in middle Tennessee. Not a rural area, but enough space and land around us. Then that it was a quiet, peaceful place. I've never seen or heard of blue fireflies or anything like that in our area. Wondering if anyone has any thoughts about what these incidents might have been or if anyone has experienced anything similar. Shadow people or some part of body of, if like hands or legs. Last house I stayed in, it was worse like I would hear moving chair sound. Mostly, I seen someone standing outside my door. I would see Shadow passing through. When I told my friend, she didn't believe. When she was visiting my home, she felt some was behind her, and she seen a shadow of it for a mere second. After that, it become more tense, like it's getting closer, like I can feel it breath. I moved out of there because a fire started in one of the rooms. I don't know how, and there was no rat or mice that may carry flammable things. To start this off, there were no bears, moose, or elk where I lived at the time. For some background information, at the time, I was around 12 or 14 years old, and I was with my friend, whom I'll call Carla. We had planned to go for a picnic in her pastures. As we walked up a smaller hill, Carla pushed me to the ground and whispered to me, Do you see that? At least 20 or so feet away was a tall creature. It stood on four thin limbs, and its head was narrow, similar to that of a horse or a deer. It was completely black. I couldn't make out features, but it had a mane just like a lion's, although it seemed flat and coarse. The mane-like fur ran along its back, stopping near the rear. It had no tail. Here's a side note. All of the cattle were moved to a completely different area, nowhere near this one. No other livestock animals were in those pastures, but this thing was just staring off. Suddenly my friend stood up and made a beeline for the exit, which was at least two miles away. I didn't hesitate to follow her. We finally stopped near the latched fence that led to her house and looked back. We had a pretty good view of the hill it stood on. It was slowly walking back into the trees. This still gives me chills to this day. At a family gathering in a city in Argentina, a second cousin asked an old uncle who used to spend summer as a kid in the house where we were partying if he could show the place where this uncle and his sister saw the flying muchachitos, little guys, when they were little. This uncle was a bit upset about the request, but after lunch a group of young relatives followed him to the backyard. Houses in most major Argentinian cities are built without gaps among them. You share walls with neighbors. Backyards are walled gardens, and this one is huge since it's a lot in the middle of the block, the back reaching its center. The family has at the end of the backyard a tiny apartment 
two floors high that it seems was designed to be used by a servant. Only space for a small kitchen and a latrine on the first floor and a bedroom on the second floor, more like a prison cell. For two sides, that part of the backyard was surrounded by tall walls of a warehouse on the other side of the block in the back of a tall house next door. The third side that corresponds to the neighbor next door has a no so tall wall and from the window of the second floor you could see its backyard. Now it is only grass, but in the old times it has a really big eucalyptus tree. So that spot was very isolated in the center of the block and when my uncle was a kid the backyard had lemon trees around that apartment that gave it more privacy. Adults would send kids to sleep over on the second floor as an adventure on hot summer nights since nobody lived there. It was used as storage. At the time I visited, it was empty and almost in ruins. Going up to the second floor was somehow dangerous because the wood on the stairs and floors was in bad condition. But my cousins really wanted to see the place where that story happened. I had no idea what was going on. Then someone asked my uncle to tell the event again. That could have happened around the early 1930s. One summer night, when this uncle was ten years old, he was sleeping there with a bunch of other kids, all family-related. Just before the sun rose, he woke up, hearing hushed voices coming from outside. His little sister was also awakened by the voices, and after a while, without saying anything, both uncle and little sister crawled in silence among the kids sleeping on the floor toward the window to spy the backyard. To keep the place cold during the hot nights, the windows were left open with a tull as a curtain to protect kids from mosquitoes. Therefore, it was easy for them to see outside. Nobody was in their backyard, but in the backyard next door, the old lady living there was standing near the eucalyptus tree, wearing a robe and holding a candle in her hand, whispering. The siblings recognized her immediately, so they did not get scared. Just the neighbor looking for a cat or something. At some point, the lady started to look to the sky and make gestures with her hand, like inviting something to come down. The siblings freaked out when around five figures slowly descended on the lady's backyard and kneeled on the ground. They were coming from the open sky, not from any tree. My uncle described them as young lads, slim, dark, not slow, short hair and brownish skin that looked opaque. The five creatures remained sitting or kneeling around the lady for what seemed to be fifteen, twenty minutes. She was smiling all the time and whispering back and forth with them. Meanwhile, my uncle and his little sister were silently frozen in the window, just peeking and not seeing. Even when they were shocked at the beginning of the experience, the siblings stayed calm, just curious about what they were seeing. That time before dawn was very calm, with no wind and no bird singing. The rest of the cans on that second floor were sound sleeping. All of a sudden, one of the creatures dropped lower to the dirt and started to convulse. That lasted a few seconds, and my uncle said that immediately it stood up without hesitation. But what was standing there was like a shadow of the critter. On the floor, there was a body heavily breathing and moaning that looked real. The lady took a robe to cover that creature and helped to walk away from the rest of the group. At that point, my uncle's sister started to shake with terror. He told us he tried to comfort her, but she was losing control of herself. He was also getting uncomfortable with the experience and could not take his eyes off the scene for a second. But then he realized that somehow all the creatures in the group were standing and looking shadowy like the one that convulsed. The one that was covered by the lady with the robe could not be seen around. After a few more whispers between the lady and the creatures, the lady blew out the candle and all creatures started to slowly ascend to the morning sky. The little ponchos were flapping around their bodies, but he could not hear any sound. When the creatures were closer to the top of the eucalyptus tree, my uncle said he could hear the leaves rustling by them, touching them. At some point, they were out of sight behind that tree, and the siblings dropped to the floor and let themselves cry a little, hugging each other. Suddenly, a horn or siren from a factory in the city loudly went off to call employees to work. My uncle told us he and her sister just freaked out and screamed like crazy. 
waking up the rest of the kids and the adults and dogs and cats in the main house. It was pandemonium, but the siblings did not say a word of what they saw. Adults were confident that one of the kids had a nightmare or something like that. Anyway, the kids and the siblings kept sleeping on summer nights in the same place for a few more years. The sighting did not repeat, and since they visited that house for summer vacations and did not live there, they never saw that lady after that. It took several years for the siblings to share the experience. My uncle told us that both were sure it was not a dream, but they did not feel they wanted to talk about it. They finally shared it when they were young adults and in a family reunion. The owners of the house where this thing happened dropped a comment that the lady next door had passed away. Both siblings started to ask questions and more questions about the lady and the house next door nonstop. Since that old lady was a little reclusive, they could not get answers in the end. They were confronted why so many questions, and they just opened the memory gates. That was another pandemonium, family laughing at them, criticizing the siblings for talking that way about such a nice neighbor that just passed away. She never was on anything weird, living along poor lady, etc. The siblings did not bring up the story anymore, but started comparing the experience and sharing memories. They finally were able to validate that it was not a dream and that they saw something. The rest of the family knew about it from this last gathering. My cousin, who asked to see the place, knew about it from his parents being present there. I'm sure on my side, close to me knew, but I never got it. After my uncle shared this with the young generation, he told us that he felt some relief. For my cousins and me, it was a nice way to feel connected with the big family. But I think that all of us considered it not a real thing, just a nice tale. Recently, I talked about it with someone present when my uncle told the story and showed us the place. She told me after that experience she had a few dreams where naked characters would drop down from the ceiling, sky, and just be a backdrop of the dream scene. Other cousins also had similar stuff happening in dreams or while meditating. In my case, on a windy day, I was driving my car with my wife and a burlap sack flew in front of the windshield and blocked my view. I pushed the brakes to the floor. When I got out of the car to get that potato sack from the windshield, I saw a huge branch from a tree on the sidewalk break and crash on a spot on the street, where I should have been if I had not stopped. When I went back to my car and told my wife that this could be related to my uncle's experience, Burlap Poncho flying around, she got really, really mad, a big fight about being credulous. This is the first time I shared my experience I live in a small wooded area in a suburb of Lexington, Kentucky. In November 2023, I was taking my dog outside. My dog's legs were going out and she couldn't walk very well because she was old. So she's taking a while. I stand out there with her to make sure she's okay. She liked to go in the backyard to do her business. She's doing said business. And I hear footsteps in the woods. I assume it's a deer or something and just tell my dog to hurry up. The steps sounded like they were all over the place, close then far, then close again. Once they sounded really close, I got my dog inside. Since I'm an idiot, I went back outside to check it out. Again, I hear footsteps and again, they're all over. Then it was suddenly really close and I saw parting in the bushes and it was huge. I ran to my house as fast as I could, and I think I sprained my ankle while doing so, and didn't look back. The next day, I'm taking my dog out again. This time, I heard a sort of whispering from all around me in the woods. Once again, told my dog to hurry up and got inside. Maybe this part is unrelated, but two weeks ago, an old man in a bright orange jacket, a cane, and a hat was walking up and down my road back and forth for about four hours. It was like 20 degrees out that day. As soon as I pointed him out to my mom, he was gone. Never saw him again. My house has cameras, so I went back through the footage to see if I could find videos of him. You know what I found? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
despite me seeing him on our cameras multiple times. I don't know what it is. I've just had a lot of strange encounters since the day I took my dog out, and it's freaking me out to explain why seeing the guy was really weird. I don't really live in a neighborhood, and I don't have any neighbors, actually. There's my house in the road, and a lot of people have died on my road, so it's not a place people walk on. There's no sidewalk or anything, just a road in woods. So seeing some guy walking on it for hours was really strange, and not at all something I've seen while living there. It might not be related, and I might be paranoid or on edge. Just a lot of strange occurrences that happened since that first one, and something isn't right. I live on the western slope of Colorado, and the strange thing about it is how my friend and I felt and what we individually saw. It was in late spring, and we were working on a campaign late in the evening, and we got the munchies. My friend only lives four blocks away from a gas station. As we were leaving the convenience store, my friend was stopped by a woman he knew growing up, and she was close friends with his mother. She was extremely intoxicated and alone. So my friend offered her a ride home to make sure she got back safely. Now here's where things got really weird. Without conversing with each other, my friend and I both felt like she was not safe to walk. I played this off as being a woman in her 60s or early 70s, intoxicated and completely alone. She claimed it was only up the block away, but it was actually a few miles outside of town. It would easily take her over a few hours for her to get home. Being in a small town, we have no Uber or Lyft, and taxis are pretty much triple the price at this hour. So we both felt really off that she was okay to walk that far at 1.30 in the morning. When we got down the road from her place, she asked us to drop her off away from her place so that her boyfriend wouldn't see our headlights. At this point, I didn't want to go into anything further, and there were so many red flags about the situation I knew it. It was best to just drop her off as requested and go back to my friend's house. As I reversed down this single-lane dirt road, I told my friend that I was going to just pull over before we got back into town because I really needed to relieve myself, and we then both agreed that she was in a very bad situation tonight. Once I turn around this bend in the road, my headlights shined into a small group of trees and bushes. I noticed this extremely large elk-like creature lowering itself from being exposed to my headlights. I could make out the face, but it wasn't normal like an elk. Large antlers, it's coming off like dead tree branches. The front legs were inverted, skinny and extremely long. I could tell because its hand legs and lower half were lower than its upper body. Could have been crouching or sitting, though. The upper torso was huge, and I thought I saw stripes on its fur. But my friend said it looked like it was its rib cage exposed. The eyes did reflect from... When the high beams exposed it in the trees, and at first, I assumed it was an elk because they're everywhere in this area. But it was extremely huge easily over 15 feet tall but thin. I didn't immediately react to it and kept driving, but when I did see it, the conversation between my friend and I stopped as if we both saw it and trying to process it. I pulled off roughly a mile away from where I saw that. I couldn't help but keep looking down the road, making sure that creature wasn't coming after us. It was a feeling I never experienced before, and when I turned around to get back into the car, I couldn't help but notice my friend staring down the road as well, doing the exact same thing I was doing. I asked him if he saw something as well, and he said what he saw was something that looked like the forest spirit in the Studio Ghibli movie Princess Mononoke. But from hell, at this point, my fear was validated, and I jumped into the car I sped off. The feeling we both had was more than a sense of dread and almost like we were being hunted, or if we were to investigate it at the time, our lives would have been in danger. I never in my life felt this type of fear before, and it was a new experience that I never in my life was to have. I'm glad she made it safe and we were in the right place at the right time to give her the help she needed. 
After that situation, I was informed about her life of substance use and struggles, that it's actually gotten worse over the years. Ever since that night, my friend and I had dealt with lots of personal things very similar. Coping with major depression as ideation, death in the family, and just an overall rough time since that night. I struggle to claim there is some association with what we saw that night, but it, it's very strange how our lives got increasingly worse since. I tried doing research, but I get a lot of stories that are hard to take in as real encounters and would love to learn more about them. This occurred about five years ago. I'm 20 now. My mother is a veterinarian and we have a clinic at the edge of Rockford, Illinois. Big town, roughly 150,000, however. When I say the edge of town, I mean cornfields for 30 miles plus to the west and five miles to the north with intermittent forestry in that area. I went with my mother to check on an overnight dog that was recovering from extensive treatment. However, there was a small pug nine, 15 pounds also there overnight, so I offered to take the dog out to do his business and save my mom one more chore. The back of the clinic faces a grass-covered pond or marsh. It dries up from time to time, but the grass is three, four feet tall. I don't remember if it was late winter, early spring, or even early fall, but no snow and the grass was tall, so my guess was early fall. The front of the clinic is next to a road and other commercial buildings, however. The back of the building, like I said, is very undeveloped. There were some leftover cookies in the clinic, so I, being a kid, grabbed one and munched on it as I waited for the pug to do his thing. I am not super fond of sweets, so I get halfway through the cookie and decide I've had enough. I remember the night having a vaguely eerie feeling. There are floodlights on the back of the clinic, though not so good lighting and... I didn't see anything and brush it off as another Midwestern night of feeling creepy. It's not uncommon. If you're from the Midwest, I'm sure you can agree, but it was quiet more so than normal. The pond is full of sounds, frogs and insects most of the time, but like I said, it wasn't summer or spring, so I brushed that off as well. I had lost interest in my cookie and decided I would throw it into the grass for small critters to have a good snack. So I launched this half cookie into the grass, maybe 15 yards away. I don't have a great arm and it's half a cookie, so nothing super far away. It lands in a taller thicket of grass towards the east and from the west. I hear and see something roughly the size of a deer or person take off as soon as my cookie lands heading straight for it. I'm well versed in local wildlife and I know how deer move. But this thing moved like a person, except it was as pale as paper and had no fur at all. I can still see its spine pushing against its skin. No arch like you get with a quadrupedal animal pulling with its front legs. Instead, like an ape or person, hunched. Its spine never straightened like it was niched over running in an inhuman way on two legs. All I saw was the shiny, semi-reflective skin of its back about two feet of it stopping at where the neck or shoulders would have started, and it had no large shoulder blades like a deer or dog or any quadruped. Instead, had a narrow chest like a sighthound or deer, but bipel with ball and socket shoulders. Not to mention deer don't run to things you throw in the grass. They are skittish. The second that cookie landed, both me and the dog stopped cold. I have never been frozen by fear, but I was then, and we just watched it for two, five seconds as it ran from one end of the grass to my cookie, where it disappeared, and I heard it run away from me after getting her and investigating the cookie. Once I couldn't hear it anymore, I immediately decided I was going back inside. The dog, however, was fixed and took a small tug of the leash to convince, but that was it. If you know small dogs, they are obnoxious and overly brave, barking at everything they don't know. But this dog never made a peep, and as soon as it realized I wanted to leave, was in complete agreement. I am not one for the paranormal or religion, but this was something I could never explain. 
I know deer, and this thing was no albino hairless deer. It was something else, with its emaciated body and pale white skin. I can still remember that night in perfect detail. It still raises the hair on my neck. The date was September 20, 1, 2022, at around noon. We were driving back from an appointment that afternoon, and I always look at hillsides and power line clearings for any kind of animal, and I have done so since I was a child. We were coming through the Laurel Ridge State Park area on Route 56 in Cambria County, Pennsylvania, near the Laurel Highland hiking trail around the trailhead. I just happened to look to the left on the embankment because something told me to look in that direction and I saw a dark brownish figure standing in between two trees with its back facing the road and it had to have been at least six, 6.5 feet tall from what I can estimate. It had one arm leaning up against the tree to the right of it and it was hunching down to pick something up. There was a defined head on it like an ape round towards the base and slowly went up to a dull point at the top. I instantly shouted, Stop! We have to turn around. My mother had no clue what was going on, and I told her that I swore I just saw a Bigfoot back there in between two trees up on the hill. So we turned the sound further up the road and went back to see if I was seeing what I thought I was or it was an actual person. However, by the time I got back to the spot, it was gone. I'm so mad I didn't have a camera rolling and it happened so quickly I didn't have time to even grab my phone to take a photo. After I processed what I had seen, I started feeling excited but almost terrified at the same time, if that makes sense. When I was younger, a toy teddy bear removed itself from my shelf and lashed itself across the room. It was a stuffed bear with guardian angel embroidered on a circular patch on its chest, and it only had one wing with the other torn off. My grandfather gave it to me, who I was extremely close to, but I never felt it was him who did that. I buried that memory and always told myself I made it up even though I knew I didn't. I moved into a rented home when I was in my early 20s. It was a new house, but had some strange activity. Things would go missing from right under my nose and return the next day or week or few months later. This really piqued my curiosity. After the aforementioned occurrences, I started listening to every paranormal story I could find on documentaries or podcasts. These stories really cemented my beliefs. I know that all these people aren't lying or blind or stupid. Some are cops, park rangers, experienced outdoors people with nothing to gain. Others are so distressed they can't tell their story without breaking down. I can honestly say that I don't know if there are aliens, Bigfoot, ghosts, whatever, but there certainly is something making people see these things. Creepy at first, ended in a face palm. I was a young sergeant in 2006 stationed at Fort Bliss. Right outside of Fort Bliss was a training area that was near Biggs Airfield. We were guarding some equipment overnight so the company wouldn't have to stay. It was me and one private. I told him he would take shifts patrolling and since we were allowed to have cars out there, the other would nap in his car. I woke up to my soldier, knocking on my window in a complete panic. It scared me at first. Private, Sergeant, wake up, there's UFOs out here. Me, what? Private points in the direction, and sure as shit I see these lights that seemed like they were floating around and then disappearing. Took me a moment as I had just woken up. That's the Franklin Mountain Range. You're looking at the cars driving on the scenic route. The cars would be visible and then disappear when they went around the corner of a turn, only to appear again when they came back around. I was very agitated at first, but the next day it was by far the funniest experience I had in the military.
We wrote it off as some of the instructors messing with us. But while training at JWTZ, there was a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the night. Definitely sounded like a woman. The lout in charge made us do a quick accountability check. Then he started radioing the training center to see what the hell happened. The instructors went out from their compound, did some checks, but didn't find anything. They said it's not the first time they had units out there calling in to report the same thing. Is a dude vanishing spooky enough? I was on one rooftop on post with another Marine, and on the building next to mine was a dude smoking a cigarette. I looked to my partner to mention it, but when we looked again, he was gone. The roof access door for that building was very rusty and loud, so there's no way he snuck out in those few seconds it took to get my partner's attention. Not my story, so I'll tell it as best I can. This happened during a rotation at the National Training Center sometime in 2015. A battle was occurring at night. A light appeared in the sky, and for ten minutes or so, there was silence. This may not seem too interesting until you look at the numbers and statistics. You're looking at massive amounts of people and equipment during a rotation, constant radio chatter, vehicle noise, people talking, etc., and suddenly just nothing. Then the light seemed to make a couple strange turns, one being around 90 degrees and split and disappear. Missed connections are the most interesting part of Craigslist. Anonymous people on an anonymous website posting things into the cybernetic aether, hoping to find a connection they missed. A missed opportunity to find eternal happiness with your one and only. And of course, there's a good amount of cringe. So much cringe. When you have a bad day and you need to cheer yourself up, I found that the fastest way to do that is by finding yourself someone who's an even sadder sack than you to laugh at. It's not the healthiest way in the world to cheer yourself up, but it's always worked for me. Well, until now, the day started off okay enough. One of the few guys on Cupid who hadn't asked me for nudes or pictures of my feet finally got up the nerve to ask me for a coffee date. I didn't have much else going on yesterday, so I decided, why the hell not? And said yes. And uh, he didn't show up. It was 30 minutes after he said he would be there when he finally texted me. Bastard had the gall to try and make up some excuse. To tell you the truth, I was too angry to read the entire thing. It wasn't quite to the point where I would block his number, but he would have to come up with a pretty damn good explanation to explain himself. So I did what I usually do when I'm feeling down about myself and started looking at the missed connections section of Craigslist. It wasn't too long before I found a pretty cringy one. You, the lady in her mid-forties at Sprouts, me, the older man in his mid-fifties. I couldn't stop staring at the tights you were wearing. I would have gone down on you right there if I could have law. If you want it, I love it. A bit terrifying for the lady, but also hilarious. I can just imagine some old fat bald guy in his mid-fifties typing this out on his computer with the dirtiest thoughts on his mind of this older lady he saw for two seconds at an organic grocery store. The thing that made this so much better was that even an old man in his fifties, an age where you expect people to know how to talk to other people, still expect some random person they saw once to remember them. Really, I think it was a lull near the end that made me laugh so hard at this. My date may have blown off our coffee, but at least I wasn't this old lonely bastard who couldn't keep himself from posting the lewdest thing he could think of on an anonymous Craigslist posting. It was after I read that that I had noticed the post about me. The girl with the pink hair. 
We were both at the Starbucks on 24th, Eston Camelback. You had pink hair, and I was too shy to say anything. Thinking of you, I dyed my hair bright pink for a Halloween costume, and the Starbucks the poster mentioned was in the fact the one I was at for my earlier failed coffee date. I'd had looked at the missed connections posting a lot over the past couple of years, but had never found one about me. I would say it was flattering, but there was something about the post that unsettled me. Thinking of you. I can't say why it was unsettling. Those three dots left a lot of implications. Could it be flattery? A threat? What exactly was he thinking about me? I'm pretty sure you can't report a post for using an unsettling ellipsis, so I just tried to ignore it as I kept searching for anything that could cheer me up. Unfortunately, it looked like I exhausted cringing at people sadder than I am on Craigslist. I was about to give up, but decided to try reloading the page and see if anything else would pop up. And that's when I saw the next post. To the girl looking at missed connections. Thinking of you. There was no way that post could be about me. Could it... There had to be hundreds, if not thousands, of people looking at missed connections right now. It was just some troll trying to scare me. Well, not me specifically, just trying to scare anyone who happens to be looking in missed connections. But there was that unsettling ellipsis at the end. It was exactly the same words in the exact same order as the post about me. Just a coincidence, of course, because it had to be. The bottom of my world fell out from under me as I reloaded the page again and saw this. Yes, Samantha, I'm talking about you. Thinking of you in your oversized white t-shirt. My name is Samantha, and I changed into my oversized white NASA shirt only an hour ago. And I have no idea what to do. Got kicked out of my shared apartment because my dog had extreme diarrhea all over some new carpet at about one o'clock in the morning. All righty then, lived in my car for a few days. Days, it really sucked, so I was desperate for a place to stay. Found an ad on Craigslist for a spot close to me that seemed like a good deal and the advertisers were eager for someone to move in. All righty then, I check it out. House and roommates seem okay. I move in. It only took 48 hours for me to realize that all three other people, the original poster dude and then a younger couple, in the house were addicted to smoking black tar heroin and my personal property was disappearing fast. I came home from a new job. I had just started down the block and my computer had vanished. Confronted poster dude, he apologizes profusely and has a breakdown with me, crying and screaming and theatrics. He decides it's best if he goes to rehab. Okay. So this leaves me alone in the house with the other two who have no intentions on going to rehab or to stop stealing my stuff. I'm desperately trying to find to find another place, but it takes me a week, and, and in that time I got completely cleared out. Everything of value I had was picked through and sold away for drugs. It was heartbreaking. To top it off, I get a call from the rehab guy after he's gone a couple days to go into his closet at home and find a little box hidden away so I can take it to a dumpster. No questions, please. I open the box before I throw it in, and there is enough drugs in it to put me in prison for years. So scary. I was young and dumb, and I also suspect that there was a dead body buried in the backyard. But that's a whole nother story. Vegas Craigslist will F you up. It was a dark and stormy night when park ranger John received a call from a distressed camper, Sarah. She had been camping deep in the woods of a remote national park and had come across a strange creature she could only describe as a Sasquatch. John, skeptical but concerned, set out to investigate. 
As he made his way through the dense forest, the wind howled and the rain pounded against his hood. He couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. But as he approached Sarah's campsite, he found no sign of the creature. Sarah, however, was in a state of panic. She insisted that the Sasquatch had been stalking her all night and that it had tried to attack her. John tried to calm Sarah down, but she was too afraid to stay in the woods. He decided to escort her out of the park. As they walked, John couldn't shake the feeling that they were being followed. Suddenly, Sarah stopped in her tracks. She pointed to a dark figure emerging from the shadows. It was a Sasquatch. John, being a park ranger, knew that these creatures are not supposed to exist and thought it might be some kind of elaborate hoax. But as the creature stepped into the light, John could see that it was real and it was huge. The Sasquatch let out a deafening roar and charged at them. John quickly grabbed Sarah and they ran for their lives. They reached the ranger station and reported the incident to the government officials in charge of the park, but they were met with skepticism and disbelief. The government officials thought it was a hoax, a publicity stunt to attract more visitors to the park. But as the days passed, more and more reports of Sasquatch sightings came in. The park was closed and a team of scientists was sent in to investigate. They discovered that the Sasquatch was not a wild animal, but a genetically engineered creature created by a mad scientist who had been experimenting with DNA manipulation in the deep woods. John tried to warn the government officials of the danger this creature posed, but they refused to listen. They were more interested in covering up the truth and protecting their own interests. As the days passed, the Sasquatch grew more aggressive and began attacking campers and hikers. Despite John's warnings, the government officials refused to take action. It was only when the creature killed several people that they finally agreed to take action. But it was too late. The Sasquatch had grown too powerful and was impossible to capture or kill. It roamed the park, terrorizing the visitors and locals alike. John, feeling guilty for not being able to stop the creature, decided to take matters into his own hands. He set out into the deep woods, determined to put an end to the terror once and for all. But the Sasquatch was too much for him to handle. In a tragic and gruesome end, the creature killed John, and his body was found by Sarah, who was camping again. The government officials, guilty of their actions, closed the park forever and tried to cover up the truth. But the legend of the creature and ranger John, who tried to save people from it, lived on. And it became a horror story that passed through generations. The tragic end of this story still haunts the deep woods of the National Park. And it's said that on stormy nights, the screams of John and Sarah can still be heard. I was a young police officer just starting out in my career. I was eager to make a difference and prove myself to my colleagues and superiors. One day, while I was on duty at the police station, I came across a strange note on my desk. It was folded up and had my name written on the front in sloppy handwriting. I opened it up and found a mysterious address written inside. It was in a part of town that I wasn't familiar with, but something about the note made me feel like I needed to go check it out. I had a strange sense of unease wash over me as I read the note, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I needed to follow through with this. I grabbed my keys and headed out to my patrol car. As I was driving, the unease only grew stronger. I tried to shake it off and focus on the task at hand, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. When I finally arrived at the address, I saw that it was an abandoned house. It was a creepy old place that looked like it hadn't been inhabited in years. I hesitated for a moment, but then I got out of my car and approached the house. I knocked on the door, but no one answered. I knew that I shouldn't go inside, but something was pulling me towards the house. I couldn't explain it, but I felt like I needed to see what was inside. So, I made the decision to break in. As I stepped inside, I was immediately hit with a feeling of dread. The place was dark and musty, and it seemed to have an energy that was all its own. I shone my flashlight around, but I couldn't see much. The room was empty, and there was a thick layer of dust on everything. 
I made my way through the house, searching for any clues or signs of what might have happened here. As I was exploring, I suddenly heard a noise behind me. I turned around, but there was nothing there. I continued on, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I heard more noises and saw shadows moving in the corners of my eyes, but whenever I turned to look, there was nothing there. I was starting to feel like I was being played with, like something was toying with me. I knew I needed to get out of there, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being drawn deeper into the house. As I turned a corner, I came face to face with a creature that I had never seen before. It was like a vampire, but different. It had long, sharp teeth and pale, clammy skin. Its eyes glowed red in the darkness. I froze, unable to move, as the creature hissed and lunged at me. It was fast, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to outrun it. I tried to fight back, but it was too strong. It knocked me to the ground and fled, leaving me lying there in the dust. I don't know how long I lay there, but eventually I was able to pull myself together and make my way out of the house. I stumbled back to my car and drove back to the police station, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I never went back to that abandoned house, and I never spoke to anyone about what I had seen. It was like a nightmare that I couldn't shake, and I couldn't bring myself to talk about it. But I knew that I would never forget that strange, terrifying creature We went camping last month, and in the middle of the night, some panicked guy started banging super hard on someone's camper, screaming maniacally, Danny, let me in. Danny, please hurry. Danny, I'm scared. Let me in. Open the door. Why are you doing this to me? Please, I'm scared. Hurry, please. Why are you doing this to me? It was a grown man, and it was like 3 a.m., and this went on for almost two hours. We tried calling all the after-hours park numbers for help, and no one answered. He sounded like he was either on drugs and having a bad trip, or like there was something else wrong with him. He was so distressed that it was genuinely disturbing, but we had our two small kids with us, who slept through it all, thankfully, and didn't feel safe approaching to see if we could help, because this man did not sound like he was in his right mind. And also, there was no way the person inside didn't hear him. So maybe they had a good reason not to let him in. Maybe they locked him out to keep themselves safe. We didn't know, but he sounded terrified, too. He eventually stopped, but then their car alarm started going off, sometimes for half-hour-long stretches for the rest of the morning. We got no sleep that night. It was definitely the strangest night camping that we've ever endured. The next day, no one had any information about what happened. During a winter camping trip in Algonquin Park, we heard two distinct and unusual noises. We heard the first noise in the evening while skiing into the park, trying to find a place to set up camp in the dark. The noise is somewhat hard to describe and sounded completely unnatural. It sounded like an electronically produced reverberation of some kind. At the time, we guessed it was some kind of weird animal call. We speculated perhaps a moose or water-moving pockets of air trapped under frozen lake ice or aliens. We later discovered that this noise was actually produced by a natural phenomenon called acoustic dispersion. Google it and listen to videos. The second noise occurred on that same night after we had bed down in tent for the night. This noise was clearly an animal or several animals, and it sounded much like laughing, yelping, or high-pitched barking. The unnerving thing about the noise was how it appeared to move through the forest, closer to the tent, right next to the tent, and eventually past the tent, and then finally far away from the tent. Whatever was producing those noises had moved through our campsite at a fairly rapid pace, but without making any discernible rustling, crunching of snow or footfalls, only the haunting vocalizations of whatever the animal was. I later heard similar noises outside of my condo window back home in a more urban setting, asked neighbors about it, and was told that the noises are made by coyotes that hunt in the wooded areas along the hydro and rail corridor.
My father and I had just left the La Burbuja grocery store and were crossing 32nd to go toward my car when we heard what sounded like a baby crying out. We thought it was maybe one of the neighbor's babies, but then my father said Mariah Maidya and was pointing toward the house across the street. I looked and saw a thin black figure perched on the brick fence post and looking directly at us. This thing was dark, dark black. It actually looked like it was absorbing the light around it. It was very easy to make out the body, the wings, and the long pointed tail that it swished around, much like a cat does when it is interested in something. The eyes were the most striking feature as they were glowing bright red and were locked directly on my father and me. I was frozen in fear, and the only thing going through my mind was how to defend my elderly father if this thing decided to attack us. I could care less about myself, but my father is seventy years old and not able to move or defend himself if he was attacked. I could hear my father praying and asking the Virgin de Guadalupe for protection and to send this thing away. I managed to tell my father that we needed to get into the car as quickly as possible so he could be safe. I pressed the button to the remote, and the horn chirped as the alarm was deactivated, and the doors unlocked. At the sound of the horn chirping, this thing opened its wings and stood up on the fence post and chirped back at us. It took off and hovered for a few seconds, its wings flapping and making a light whoosh sound. My father and I dove into the relative safety of the car as this thing flew away and was gone from our sight. This thing was maybe three, four feet tall and thin, but its wings were large and maybe ten feet when spread apart. They looked a lot like bat wings. No feathers were visible as it was jet black. We drove straight home and my father told my mother and my sister about our encounter with this thing and what had happened. My mother said it was probably a brugia disguised as a lechuza and that we were lucky we were not attacked either way she refused to let anyone out of the house for the rest of the night my friend and i used to go cycling in the woods every weekend in summer when we were younger around the ages of ten thirteen the woodland near where i live suburbs of london is ancient and has a lot of history, especially with old ruinous manors from the medieval times dotted around. We have so many happy memories from that period, but one really peculiar and scary evening stands out. One evening we went deep into the woods and checked out this old abandoned farm where there were these huge pine trees in the center of the field. We had to hop a couple fences to reach these trees, and there was always something majestic about these isolated trees in a field. Anyways, when we left the field, it must have been around six, seven o'clock, as it was still crystal blue sky. In England, it doesn't get dark until about nine, ten in summer. I remember we both had this unbelievable sense of dread and panic that come over us, so we cycled off as fast as we could towards the exit, which was a tunnel into the back road. This was only a five-minute cycle from the field with the isolated pine trees. However, my friend disappeared, and it felt like within a matter of minutes it was pitch black. I remember waiting at the entrance of the tunnel for my friend as I was too scared to go through it alone, and it felt like I was waiting for hours. He turned up eventually, and he had no explanation as to where he had gone. Essentially, it felt as though two, three hours had been compressed into five minutes and daylight turned to dusk, with a flick of a switch. To this day, I have no explanation as to what the sensation we felt was, and how time seemed to warp. Those woods have always had an eerie and mystical feel about them. That sound brought one of my brothers into the house to alert the rest of the family to come hear this. We went outside and stood in the driveway and heard the most frightening guttural roar you can imagine. This accompanied the pounding on the wood object. This lasted several minutes. The evening was clear, warm, and without wind. I do not remember a moon. Neither brother could explain what was happening, and I recall being scared out of my wits. When the sound subsided, the family returned inside. The incident was not discussed in front of me again. As a child, I was privileged to live in this remote, beautiful area and be allowed to run free.
Sometime later, a boyfriend and I observed what we were told must have been a bear in a thicket of alder trees near the house. The feces found there later contained crawdad shells and berry seeds with a horrible odor. But the creature we saw was not a bear. The hard, dry ground showed no tracks. Our fathers were loggers, and we were well versed in the local wildlife. While this all happened a very long time ago, I still get cold chills remembering those sounds. Years later, my fiancé and I were driving north on Oregon Highway 101 near Cape Perpetua, north of Florence, Oregon. The highway was narrow, two lane with the Pacific Ocean on the west and steep rock cliffs on the east. I was watching the moon over the ocean, turned sideways facing the ocean. A very large black creature rose from a cliff in the cliff and towered over the little car we were in. My fiancé yelled, What the hell was that? I only caught a glimpse of the thing through my peripheral vision, but it was huge and very fast. I suppose we surprised it as much as it surprised us. It terrified me. My fiancé searched for a place to turn around as he wanted to go back, and I refused to let him. We were armed with what suddenly seemed to be a very small weapon, considering the size of the creature. When we returned home, my fiancé told his father about the encounter. His father told us of the rancher at the foot of the capes, also on Highway 101, who had been riding to check on his cattle when he heard a cow bellowing in agony. His horse became nervous, but he forced it on and found a very large, hairy animal chewing on the live cow. He carried a thirty-point-six rifle and shot the creature. It stood up and ran off on two legs. He followed until he lost the trail of blood in the rocky terrain. This is the first time I have ever heard of someone shooting and wounding one of these creatures. It is also the first time I have heard of this creature eating the meat of any animal. Our encounter was in the late evening with clear skies and a full moon. My fiancé saw the creature in the headlights and had a great view of it. He knew it was not a bear and didn't think it was a human in a pursuit. Facial features did not have a snout and the arms were too long for a bear's front legs. I was too terrified to grasp any features. I have never felt fear like that before or, or since. I went camping on Lake Michigan shore one time. I was solo and it was rustic. I was on a small ridge close to the beach but couldn't actually see the shore. My small fire was dying and I was about to turn in when I started hearing this strange wet whack sound on the beach. Happened two or three times in succession. Sounded like a watermelon being hit with a baseball bat. Then all of a sudden a light appeared over the ridge. Looked like it was scanning the tree line. After a second, the light goes back down and I hear a couple more whacks. Silence, then a few more whacks. Twenty, thirty feet down the beat. Then the light is back. Then three more lights pop up and start moving up and down the beach. Then they left. There were definitely points in time where I was sitting there, knife in hand, waiting for this band of rogues to come murder me. I researched when I got home, and I think they were just digging for clams or mussels or something. But for 15, 20 minutes, it was real, real creepy. Crown Land, camping in Ontario in early January. It was an isolated spot beside a fairly large lake, which was completely frozen over. Temperature hovered around 8 Celsius the whole trip, but went above freezing for a day. After the sun set, the frozen lake began making an eerie noise every few minutes like a low-flying jet, followed by a massive, slow bloop coming from the depths of the lake. Occasionally, a crack would shoot across the sheet of ice covering the lake shore to shore, about half a kilometer in less than a second. Buddies were freaking out at first, speculating we had awoken a lake monster or something, probably smoked too many joints that night. Obviously, these were the natural sounds of the lake as it melted, possibly something to do with the fluid dynamics as it changed state from solid ice to liquid water. Just a theory, but nevertheless, we were in awe of the forces of nature at work. All the more terrifying, considering the day before we had been screwing around on the frozen lake, unaware that the entire ice sheet was melting away underneath us. Falling through the ice would put an end to the fun quickly.
I decided to rent a cabin way up in northern Michigan for a week with my sister Tanya. My sister is a writer, and this was also what she needed because she hadn't written in two weeks. So off we went. It was late May and still quite chilly, but we didn't care about the weather because we weren't there for sunbathing on the beach. The cottage was rustic but recently redone, and it was located on a small pond, but was surrounded by thick woods. Our cottage was the last one down a long dirt road. The cottage owner had put in several really nice long trails, because if not then, nobody was enjoying the woods. The first day, we were unloading our luggage from the car, and a young guy and his mom walked up the driveway. They introduced themselves and said they owned the house a little way down the road, and they went for walks a few times a week for exercise past the cottage. The mother Linda mentioned that her husband had passed away a few years earlier, and of course I told her that I lost my husband Josh a few months earlier as well. Linda looked so sad for me, but her son Brendan had a smirk on his face which really creeped me out. Linda seemed to notice this as well and said, Okay, let's leave these ladies to unpack, and then said their goodbyes. I was unnerved by the way Brendan looked at me, and I noticed he kept looking back at me as they walked away. On the first day, we just hung around the cabin. The next day, I went for a walk alone so Tanya could get some writing done. I chose the path the owner said was the easiest. I had been walking for ten minutes when I heard the sound of a small animal moving through the underbrush, maybe something the size of a rabbit, so I stopped to listen, and when I stopped, the rustling stopped. I happened to glance back, and I saw the shape of a human standing behind the thicket. I thought it was Brandon, so I turned and kept walking. I was almost halfway, and I'd see a tree about thirty feet in front of me, but completely surrounded by the same thicket. I saw what again I perceived to be a naked Brandon. I couldn't see clearly because he was shrouded in darkness, but I saw him perched on the bottom limb of a tree, just crouched there, staring at me. I could see one hand holding the limb he was crouched on, and his other arm was wrapped around the tree trunk. But now that I look back and I know what I was looking at, I can't believe I thought it was Brandon. A day or two later, I was finally able to pull Tanya away from her laptop, and we were on the porch to watch the sunset. We distinctly heard a wolf howl from at least the other side of the pond. We agreed it was really close, but we weren't too worried. We were more worried about the mother bears, as we were told by Linda and the cabin owner that we needed to keep the bear spray on us at all times because the cubs were very young, and the mothers were really protective. About ten minutes later, we heard an animal screaming. Oh, my gosh, we were both saying and covering our ears. Tanya was saying this is too close to nature for me. Then Tanya went in to use the bathroom, and when she came back, she said, What is that? And pointed to the wood line. I saw the shrubs shaking. Then an animal came out of the woods with a baby deer hanging from its mouth. The baby wasn't just a newborn. We looked at pictures showing various ages, and it was probably two weeks old, approximately. We are not country girls, so please don't get on me for being wrong. Anyway, Tanya said, no, I don't want to see this, and she went inside. I sat looking at this animal. I was fairly certain the fawn was already dead, or I would have done something, at least I'd like to think I would have. What? I don't know. But regardless, I was trying to figure out what this animal was. It was walking into the open from the woods. It dropped the fawn from its mouth. Then it started sniffing it. I was fairly certain that this was a very large wolf with a case of the mange because its hair was thick around the neck like a lion's mane, and it was thin to bare in spots. Its rear end was bald, and I didn't even see a tail. I noticed it looked almost deformed because the back end sat way lower than the front. The animal seemed almost mesmerized by the fawn. It stared and sniffed at it. Then it pushed it forward or over by using its nose. Then it picked it up by the mouth and started shaking it side to side viciously. Then it started biting into the midsection. And when it lifted its head to chew, you could clearly see intestines hanging out of its mouth. Now I believe I let out a sound at that point because it looked at me surprised and then ran about ten feet to the large tree. It turned around and literally stood on its back legs. Oh, my gosh. I realized this was the thing I saw up in the tree. 
I could clearly see the eyes were rusty colored and they were illuminated. They were glowing from the inside. It was starting to turn dusk. It just continued to stand there behind that tree. It seemed to be apprehensive a little, but it was staring at me, and then it would look towards the phone. At one point, I thought I saw it lift its lip, and the whole muzzle started to vibrate like it was trying not to bare its teeth. Finally, it got down on all four feet and started walking slowly to the fawn. When it was almost there, it swung its head in my direction and let out a low, menacing growl. At the same time, it bared its teeth. This animal was at least 400 pounds. It could be even bigger, but I'm afraid that the naysayers will call me a liar. This animal was at least three to four times as big as my German Shepherd. All the way around its head was huge. But what really terrified me was when it sneered at me and went down for the fawn. Its teeth were at least three inches long, sharp and jagged. When it got to the fawn, it picked it up in its mouth and took off at a fast slope. We didn't leave for walks after that. We barely left the cabin. When we did leave the last day, we drove over to that tree, and I got out and stood beside where it stood. And I can say without a doubt it was well over six and a half to seven and a half feet tall. We drove past Linda's house, and on second thought, I asked Tanya to turn back around. I wanted to tell them what we saw. Linda was genuinely concerned and seemed shocked to hear what we saw. She appreciated that we thought enough to stop. When we got home, we called the landlord, and he said straight away that we were warned to carry bear spray, so I just left it at that. I figured he thought we wanted our money back, and that wasn't the case. So, that's our story. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a Bigfoot. taking a day hike with a friend on the Appalachian Trail in New Jersey many years ago. It was a nice day, and we were hiking and making idle chat, all of a sudden, from the low brush along the side of the trail, right next to our feet, came this ear-piercing, high-pitched and long screaming sound. I can only describe it like a woman screaming after in helium. We froze in our tracks, and it screamed for about five seconds. Although it felt like longer, whatever it was started running off through the brush and bushes. Neither of us even caught a glimpse of it. It felt like a sci-fi or horror, moving where we could see the grass and branches rustling while it ran off. But neither of us saw a single part of it or even get an idea of the shape and size. But the brush was only thigh high, so it couldn't have been too big. After being frozen in place from surprise and fear for about 30 seconds, we decided to keep walking and talk about it after we gained some distance. But we had very little to discuss other than a repeated, What the hell was that? Growing up with stories about the New Jersey Devil didn't help our imaginations. But you never know. This incident occurred in Memphis, Tennessee. I started my career as a Memphis police officer a few years previously in the 1980s. I was on a special assignment at the time. It was 2 a.m., and it was a clear summer night, but quite humid. I was in my personal vehicle with the top down and the radio playing. I was still in my uniform, including my bulletproof vest and a gun belt with all the regular equipment attached to it. I was heading south on Covington Pike at a good rate of speed and was the only one on the road. This part of the road connects the Riley Bartlett area to the Burr area. The road is slightly elevated as the surrounding area is low and running through it is the Wolf River, which is a few miles from here and connects to the Mississippi River. This area is commonly referred to by the locals as the Wolf River Bottoms these days. As I was driving in my peripheral vision, over to my right, just outside my headlight beams, I noticed something was moving fast, directly toward the front of my car. I immediately slammed on the brakes, thinking that a deer was running across the road. But I couldn't have been more wrong. It came to a screeching halt right in the middle of the road, right in front of my headlights, not more than seven feet from my bumper, as we both froze in place, staring at each other for several seconds. It appeared to be three to four feet tall, but was also crouched. It could have been closer to five if it stood straight up, but I got the impression that its current body posture was its normal way of standing. 
It had a large head, at least compared to its skinny, slender body. It appeared to be dark gray and greenish in color, similar to the color of an alligator, but the appearance of its skin looked like a similar texture to a human's. It had dark, large oval eyes on each side of the upper part of its face, running slanted from the top portion of its head to about the midsection of its head. It was kind of pointing inward to where you would expect a nose to be. However, from what I could tell, there was no distinct nose, at least none like a human. Below the eyes was a very thin, dark, almost black line, which I assumed was its mouth. It ran from about the same location a human's mouth would be. However, the line ran straight across the lower face in front, and then turned upward and slightly back on the head. It had no ears that could see. Its body and chest area were rounded like a human, but vastly smaller, almost like a child's. Its arms appeared to be longer and somewhat disproportionate to its body, and they were skinny and had an insect-type look to them. I could make out hands, but they were also completely folded at the wrist joint. The legs were long because even with this thing's shortness, I could make out the top of them even with it so close to the bumper which was obscuring the bottom half somewhat. They were like the arms, thin and insect-like, but appeared to be jointed. I did notice its chest area moving slightly like it was breathing, but it seemed slow and steady. I never noticed anything like genitalia. There was no hair any place that I could see in. I'm not even sure if it was wearing any type of clothing. If it was, it would have had to be skin tight. I never noticed a tail at any point. My adrenaline was pumping, and it was only a brief period of observation. It again took off like a shot, and it was out of my headlights. I could still make out its outline in the darkness, and it was moving like a sprinter. It leaped over the guardrail onto the other side of the road and down the embankment. I will admit that this was not the only bizarre incident that I had during my career, but it definitely was the strangest. I never told anyone on the force about the encounter. In fact, I only mentioned it to a close friend during these many years. I can only identify it as a lizard man or an unknown humanoid. I would have never believed it unless I actually witnessed it. When I was 11 or 12, I was at a Boy Scout camp in the Midwestern USA talking with some friends in the tent at night. For some reason, I poked my head out through the flap to look outside, and I saw a scene that was totally bizarre. I was deep in a forest, but I saw red lights moving all around as though there were some kind of carnival in front of me. Some of the lights were moving in circles or back and forth. One thing looked like an arrow with stripes that was motionless at first, and then launched and bounced back and forth slightly, as though it were attached to a stiff spring. I was mesmerized by it, but I had no idea what on earth I was looking at. I didn't see any people or anything unusual other than the red lights, and I didn't hear anything out of the ordinary. Otherwise, it was just darkness and trees. I pulled my head back into the tent and told my friends I saw something weird. One of them poked his head out and said he saw it too, but he couldn't describe it, and I think he just thought I was playing a joke and wanted to join in. I looked out again myself, and I saw someone's flashlight moving in the distance as they walked, but that wasn't anything out of the ordinary. To this day, I have no idea what that was about. My depth perception of the lights felt strange, as though I was seeing two images at the same time, the actual dark forest in front of me, with a moving image of the lights superimposed over it. I was skeptical of aliens and UFOs, but it definitely had me thinking about them. I told everyone about it the next day in detail, and nobody else had seen anything similar. It was just a weird thing that nobody could explain. This happened in fall of 2020, one in Hammiston Turi Wilderness area in Finland. I had already been in the bush for 15 weeks and still had about a week left. No people in sight except a friend who I parted ways with after a couple of days and a reindeer herder so far away. I don't think he even spotted me. I was making my way towards this old dilapidated wilderness hut 
which was not in use anymore, and suddenly I hear talking. I stop and try to listen. Where is the sound coming from? It sounds like multiple guys. After a while, I can pinpoint the direction and start walking there to say hi. I stumble in the middle of four guys in their mid-twenties, high as balls, eyes red, cockmouth, and one dude is playing some shitty Reggie from a Bluetooth speaker. Now at this point, the nearest road is approximately 30 kilometers away. We start chatting, and I spot that these guys' gear is a bit makeshift-esque. Not judging, but these guys don't give out the vibe of a hardened hiker who makes their own gear. After a bit of chatting, I learn that. These guys don't have a map. They don't have a compass. They have a shit ton of weed. They have consumed a lot of it. Now I try my best to give these guys some directions, but they are high F. Looking at my map, I spot a stream which goes towards the road. Their car is at. So I guide them to follow this stream, and when they arrive to the road, turn right, and after one kilometer, they will arrive to their car. I had to handwrite these instructions four times on a piece of toilet paper in hopes that one always has those instructions. We parted ways. They gladly offered some weed, which I declined, did get a small bottle of whiskey, though. After my hike, I had to Google missing hikers in Hamastuntry, but didn't find anything, so I think they got it out of. This happened in 2016, so I was around 20, 122. Friend was driving me home from her house. The road we normally took, back road but very busy with traffic, was closed for construction, so we took the detour road. We had the windows down because we had finished a blunt at about 15 minutes prior. This was a 30 minutes ride back to my house. Halfway through the detour road, we both get this sense of absolute evil dread, and we then both notice that there is no sound. No nature sounds, frogs croaking, breeze through the trees, wind from the car. The radio was on and not playing music, no matter how we fwith the channel or the volume. It was like we were in an air pocket with absolutely no sound whatsoever. You could barely see outside, but we at least could make out trees and shit with the headlights. Nope. Looked like we were in a completely dark tunnel. Lasted about five minutes, and then all of a sudden, the noise came back on with this sudden pop. Frogs, trees, the sound of the car, the radio, all of it. We kind of just sat still and said nothing, and as soon as we saw a gas station, she pulled over and we smoked a cigarette, and we were both kind of like, ah, what just happened? <laughs> Everything was 100% normal after that, and it never happened again. I've been on that road hundreds of times since, but it was genuinely strange, and it scared the shit out of both of us. I'm located in the 559. There are a lot of Mary Jane growers out here. There was an illegal farm out in the country country of Clovis. It was ran by Asians. To conceal the grow-off, the family had chickens and cows and other animals, so it actually looked like a normal ranch. On the ranch, there were trimmers, probably about 15, 20 of them. One day, the family woke up and found half of their chickens dead. They couldn't figure out what caused for them to die. About a week later, the rest of them died. The crazy thing was that there weren't any lacerations or anything. It was as if they just dropped dead. Because of that, the family decided to install cameras out in the backyard. About two months after the first incident with the chickens, it happened again to their new flock. They watched the cameras and saw an orb zip through them, and they literally dropped dead. This was in August of 2012. It was about 2 a.m., and a tremor had her head flip 360. Literally, her neck was twisted in a full circle. Everyone freaked out and scurried off. Everyone ended up finding out that she was from Laos and was here for trim season. It's obviously been years now and no one, the Laotian community, has seen her or heard of her since. She was last seen in a Thay restaurant in a restroom sucking on tampons. I'm not making this stuff up. It was all captured on video. The property had to be blessed by monks. And the land is no longer a grow operation either. For those of you that don't believe in black magic, 
Well, that stuff is real. It's legit. Overseas, Thailand or Laos, someone must have put a spell on her and sacrificed her for who knows what reason. It's a super common thing there. You don't believe in that stuff until you witness or experience it firsthand. In our culture, she's known as Phi Pob. She looks human during the day, but feeds on blood and human souls. If you're legit interested in this scary stuff, look up Asian black magic and what can happen from it. I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaska Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January, the sun hadn't quite come up yet. And when I say the sun hadn't come up, I mean in almost a month and a half, polar nights are intense. The particular well site we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska, deep in the wilderness. Our job took a week, but we finished and were headed back to camp to finish our hitch and go home. At the beginning and end of the ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out of for safety. No cell reception and radios work only up to a distance. If you don't check in or out in a set time, they come looking for you to ensure you're not a popsicle. It was about four in the morning, not that it mattered, in the land of endless night, and we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles per hour. When something appeared on the road in our headlights, it was a man in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket, walking down an ice road in wilderness tundra at 4 a.m., and it was 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down, and he's trying to get back to the guard shack. Seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us as our trucks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold. His clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He still didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotions. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming off him. He smelled. Acidic, if that makes sense. There was just a lot about this guy that made the hair on my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later said he was just going to try and shake him out of his stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him, though this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at my buddy and then at me, with this look of pure rage not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment, this guy starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held on to my buddy to keep him inside. After several moments... If could only have been a few seconds at most, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to the guard shack another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we had just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling a prank, but policy said they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore and when he pulled back his sleeve there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. 
We filed a report with the guard, and we are told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened, and it was a quiet drive the rest of the way. We flew home the next day. The next time we saw the guard at this shack, we asked him if they ever saw Mr. Popcycle on his patrols. He told us they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12-hour shift and saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank and that he'd get us back for making him waste a shift driving around. But it wasn't a prank. Who would make up a story like that? And who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfying answer to what happened that evening. I still wonder about that dude, if he even was a dude. The Alaskan tundra is a weird place, and that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there. I'll work to write down more of my experiences and share them to the appropriate subs. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.